Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody, welcome to Big Blend Radio's third Tuesday Go to Natchitoches show, because you must go to Natchitoches. You can't go to Louisiana and not go to the oldest city in the state. I'm serious. It was founded in 1714, and it's the original French colony, and as I said, the oldest city in Louisiana. And today we're going to talk about some of the history uh, that you can experience there. We're going to talk about civil rights history, Black history. We're going to talk about women's history. Uh, We're just going to get into a whole bunch of history, and we've got two special guests joining Joining us, as always, we have Arlene Gould, who's the executive director of the Natchitoches Convention and Visitor Bureau. I encourage you to go to their website, which is Natchitoches.com. Now, if you have not been to Natchitoches, uh, you may know or you may not know that it Natchitoches is spelled N-A-T-C-H-I-T-O-C-H-E-S. So it's a little bit different than how we pronounce it. So Natchitoches.com. So welcome back, Arlene. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me today on the show. I'm always happy to be here with you all. Yeah, it's always exciting. And um, if I don't bring this up, Nancy will come hit me over the head. Um, congratulations. Another award for Natchitoches. And, but this time is for the Convention and Visitor Bureau. I saw that you won the uh, CVB award for the state. We did last week. We were in New Orleans for the annual Louisiana Travel Association and Louis Awards. And Natchitoches Convention and Visitors Bureau came home with outstanding CVB of the year. So we were very yeah. happy and pleased and proud to be uh, to be able to, you know, uh, represent our community and bring home an award for the Natchitoches uh, community. So. That's awesome. Well, that is you. awesome. Well, congratulations. I know you, you are always busy, you and your staff, um, getting people over to Natchitoches to experience the food, the drive through daiquiris, the meat <laughs> pies, the festivals, the Christmas lights, the bed and breakfast, all the lodging, um, all the historic sites, uh, part of uh, No Man's Land, El Camino, Real de los Tejas National Historic Trail, the Cane River National Heritage Area. <gasps> Well, this Lake. goes on and on and on. <laughs> I mean, it's true. For a small town of like Natchitoches of 18,000 residents and only 40,000 in the parish, which most people, you know, refer to as counties, we're still pretty rural, but we, uh, we're, we're pretty big at heart, big at history and big in our culture. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. And a little a bit of sports. Speaking of awards, we're going to go uh, to your neighbor next door from the CVB office, the Visitor Bureau office. Uh, we're going to go to the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, and also it's part of the Louisiana State Museum. And we've got Janae Biniscombe joining us as she is the branch director. So welcome back to the show, Janae. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Hey, this is great. I, I wanted to touch base. And number one, I will talk about uh, the new inductees uh, for the uh, Sports Hall of Fame. But Everyone, you can go to louisianastatemuseum.org uh, for the website there. Um, but this is really interesting. You have the Sports Hall of Fame, but then you've also got the History Museum. So people can kind of get, I, I think that you're one of the first places people should go to when they come to uh, Natchitoches. Get, gives a nice overview. I agree. It does give a great overview. And we have something for everyone, for the Arden sports fan, for the Arden history buff. It's two museums in one. It's a great deal. <laughs> And why was uh, Natchitoches chosen for the State Museum uh, for for sports in, in specific? Well, you know, the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame itself uh, has always been in Natchitoches. You know, they may have had a few things going on in Shreveport or so on, but it, it was always centered here in Natchitoches. NSU had the exhibits from the, the 1970s, you know what I mean? So they it was always sort of part of Natchitoches. And then the State Museum had the old Courthouse Museum, which was the History Museum here. So it really kind of made sense to keep the Hall of Fame in Natchitoches and then incorporate that history section with new revamped exhibits uh, and just to, to, to stay here in Natchitoches. You know, the other thing, too, uh, it, obviously with the university there, but I do want to bring up that, isn't it um, June, July that you have your big party at the Sports Hall of Fame? It's usually the last weekend in June, but we have, it has been um, adjusted to the last weekend in July this year uh, mm-hmm. to accommodate uh, some of the inductees like Eli Manning to make sure everyone could come. Eli Manning, now you got Terry Bradshaw in there? Oh yeah, he's in, he's in the I, did, I had to bring him up, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a necessary thing. So who are, who's, who's um, being inducted this year? You said Eli Manning? 
Uh, we have Eli Manning. We have um, Walter Davis, who is a Olympian. He's a track star. We have Wendell Davis, who is a wide receiver football, played for LSU. We have um, a Walter, I have to say this right, Imahara, I believe it is. And he is in for weight. He's going to go in for uh, weightlifting. Uh, oh. he, yes. Yeah, so that's, uh, something different for us. Uh, Matt Forte, he's a former Tulane star and also played for the Chicago Bears and NFL. So we have sort of a, we have 10 inductees total. We have everyone's from a uh, lot of people from different sports. We have a couple of coaches coming in too. So it'll be a great induction. And it's a beautiful building too. That's the other part. I want people to know about the architecture. Uh, this was not a uh, cheap building to build. <laughs> I'm just going to say, <laughs> putting it bluntly, uh, this was this was quite a unique. You, what you see on the outside and when you go on the inside are two different things. Yes, it's uh, it has won awards. It was uh, number one architecture in the wor- uh, project in the world in 2013 from Azure Magazine. Um, it's over a thousand individual pieces of cast stone, all different sizes. And uh, if you look at some of the pictures, it's really kind of neat. It's almost like a jigsaw puzzle where it has a steel framework and then the, the, the uh, cast stone was put to fit, to, to make it look. A lot of people think it looks like, like a stadium tunnel, yeah. but actually the design is the cut of Cane River. It's that That's smooth right. stone, the smooth walls that a river makes. We have uh, the light fixtures, look like the little pebbles in the light fixture. The copper around the building is louvered for the louvered shutters of plantation homes. Uh, so it's all very uh, inspired by the, the natural world and the cultural world around us. That's amazing. And and you do have women in there too, by the way. I, I know when we were in the museum, of course, you got Clementine Hunter. We're going to talk yes. about her. Uh, but uh, that's why I say you're, you're a good starting place for, um, I think, you and, and Grand Decor. Uh, and that's still going, right? The Grand Decor, uh, Arlene, is still open yes, for everyone Decor, to go to? Yes, out on Red River. Yes, the Grand Decor Welcome Center is still out there on, on Red River. Uh, they're course. opening a new, a new visitor center, right? Uh, well, the new visitor center is going to be the uh, old train depot from the 1920s. Uh, it closed in, I want to say, 1967 in the middle of the civil rights movement. And they are restoring that now as we speak. And when it reopens in just a couple of short months, it will be the home of the Nash- Cane River Creole National Historical Park. It will be their headquarters here in Natchitoches and also a visitor center, an interpretive center. So it's going to be oh. fabulous. Well, we have to come back now. Of <laughs> See, course. I could just give another big list of reasons why. But, um, you know, so I wanted to talk about women, too in the sports hall of fame because i remember women's basketball uh displays uh exhibits and there were just there you you don't just do men because i think a lot of times we talk about a sports hall of fame and we forget that women play a big role in sports as well right and in fact alana beard she is a uh basketball player and she is being inducted she played for the wnba and um she uh she was actually 2000 miss basketball in louisiana so we, have, we induct women all the time. In fact, one of my favorite things about the Hall of Fame is that you really, everyone gets to see reflection of themselves. You know, uh, whatever your race is, male or female. I just, I love that. Like kids can come here and they can see themselves. And they see yeah. that, wow, look at Danielle Scott won five Olympic gold medals for volleyball. I play volleyball. <laughs> so it's I inspiring. Just, I love that. Uh, again, we have women, we have men, uh, all different sports, uh, and even uh, we have two sportsmen and men, two people in for sportsmen. So hunting and fishing and so on. So it is. It's really all inclusive, and I, I just said I love that people get to see themselves reflected in our inductees. Well, I have no clue about sports. Like, I really don't know anything. The only thing is, like, if, you know, Arlene stood at the edge of, like, a sports field and held up a daiquiri or a glass of wine, uh-huh. I may be able to run in a straight line. Maybe. Not afterwards. But that's about as far as I go. But going through the Sports Hall of Fame, I have to say it's really true because you're telling the stories of people's journey for achieving their goals. And it's about fitness and focus. And it's also community stories because I think sports plays a big role in 
you know, showcasing a community when a, a player goes out and then they end up in all the, you know, press conferences and everything, they're representing their community, their backstory and, you know, their family and where they're from. So I think that's a really cool thing for people to come in and also see and understand, you know, it's sports is not easy, man. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. You know, and, and, oh, and a agree, lot of times. You know, and we've done programs. We did an Olympic lecture series. And that's really what the Olympians talked about. I mean, they said these are Olympian winners and they talked about the communities that embrace them and how they encourage them and how proud they were that they were representing their country. And, and uh, we just did a, we just opened up our latest uh, addition to the permanent exhibits. We did a Heisman Trophy exhibit with the four Heisman Trophy winners from Louisiana. Um, and uh, again, you know, it's a lot, it's not just putting stuff on display it's kind of telling their stories and how and winning that award and how special it is i mean out of all of them we only have four from louisiana so far we never know <laughs> hey you Devante never know Smith, joe burrows uh john david crow and uh um uh of course billy cannon so um so yeah like i said it's, it's so much more than just playing a sport it has to do with character and community and you know sort of bringing people together and health you know, it's, it's fitness as well. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, that's no wonder I don't know anything about sports, <laughs> but anyway, uh, but you know, one thing too, going in there, um, the, the last time we were there, I believe it was when you had, uh, the Hearst, uh, for Martin Luther King, yes. uh, Jr. That was there. And so I know we want to, you know, we've talked a little bit uh, over the years over Cane River Creel National Historical Park, Cane River National Heritage Area, St. Augustine, uh, such a famous church, um, yeah, there's just so much history that you, I mean, we could do a history show every month on Natchitoches and never be done, right? A lot of historic women will touch on to Melrose Plantation, um, Clementine Hunter, the artist, folk artist. Uh, but you know, you were saying that there's civil rights history we should touch on too that we really haven't talked much about. And my first introduction is like, hey, you got Martin Luther King Jr.'s hearse in there. That's that's like wild. Like that was that really was. When you see it just it makes things so real you know when you see something like that yeah you know the owner of that is he owns kane's restaurant and he restored that hearse and over the years it has toured um it was actually touring universities when it came to us and nsu said hey look at you know we think more people would come to see it you have a better space for it can can we display it there for the week and we wound up having it a little bit over a week and i said of course yes but, mm-hmm. you know, it, it is, so it was touring universities at that, that time before that, it was touring museums because it was in our Baton Rouge Museum, I think for a whole year. So, um, well, you know, the, it's so wonderful that he restored it and he wants people to know the history and he wanted to, to travel around because I was so much more moved than I thought I was going to be when it mm-hmm. got here. I said, I'm just, mm-hmm. I, I was surprised at how much it affected me to see it, to actually see it. And to sort of reread the story of it and, uh, and, and, so, and think about it. And, and a lot of people said that to us, you know, that sort of physicalness, that presence of it, uh, mm. it was just very, very moving. Mm. So in regards to Natchitoches, what was it like during the Civil War? Because you start thinking about like the plantations and what was going on with, you know, slavery and, and Melrose Plantation definitely has uh, interesting stories uh, going to uh, the Cane River Creole National Historical Park, the two different parts, Melrose, uh, and then uh, also what's well, two different Melroses, right? Am I get? Is it Magnolia? Ma- uh, Magnolia and Magnolia Oakland are the two uh, national parks. Yeah, and then Melrose is kind of located in between the two national park sites here in Nashville. Yeah, and they have the. It was Magnolia that has the slave cabins. Um, yes. The I think they're the only uh, brick slave cabins left standing in the country. I, I don't know if they're the only ones left standing, but they are there. And then they also had the big barn that had the cotton uh, press, uh, the gin, where they had the, the mule uh, corkscrew, where the mules would go in the circle and, and press the cotton bales. You know, Nancy it, made me go do that. She made me go still, walk it like a mule. <laughs> it's still in the original site. I mean, it's been there for uh, 200 years. So, or, you know, it's just, you know, it's both of those sites are unique in their own stories. And both of those sites are the only two bicentennial farms or national bicentennial farms west of the Mississippi River because they were owned and farmed by the same families for over 200 years. And they've both been turned over to the national park system for future generations to uh, 
on to enjoy and learn from. And uh, it's nice that they've been preserved. Mm. So th they definitely went through the Civil War era, um, yes. you know, Melrose Plantation. What can you tell us on the museum side at the Sports Hall of Fame, the museum side for civil rights history? Well, uh, you know, after re during Reconstruction, I say after the Civil War, you know, uh, African Americans faced a lot of violence, a lot of um, intimidation, trying to get their political and civil rights. Mm hmm that it went on for many, many years. And by the 1890s, there were actually laws that were sanctioning this uh, kind of racial segregation and subjugation. So we have a couple of figures here in the museum that we focused on. We have Reverend Rayford Blunt. He was of the Republican Party um, and he uh, it was African-American at, mostly at that point. And in 1878, he and his followers tried to convene a Republican convention here in Natchitoches. And they, they, the white Democrats arrested him and 300 other people at a land bridge in Natchitoches. Eventually, you know, he, they were forced to leave Natchitoches. He was, he did, he eventually did come back and he was always a member of the Republican party and he really fought for um, fair elections and um, uh, it just is an, an access to political voting for African Americans. Uh, so that was really throughout his career. He actually was uh, part of the First Baptist Church here in Natchitoches. And by the time he passed away in 1905, he had about 200 members of his church. So, you know, he was very active in the community up until the end. Um, and then we have um, John Gideon Lewis Sr. Now, during that time too, you know, Masonic Lodges started mm -hmm. to really develop and they were kind of social organizations, but the, you know, for the African-Americans, they became a lot more, they became kind of almost civil. They not only provided social activities, but they um, had uh, widow's pensions and orphan relief funds and, uh, you know, other things that actually helped the community. They became really central to the African American community. And he was, uh, he started the uh, Prince Hall Masons of Louisiana in 1900. And then he was its most worship, worshipful grand master until 1931 when he passed away. So wow. uh, it was, that was such an integral part of this community uh, for African Americans. And some of you may have heard of Dr. E.A. Johnson, he and his wife, um, and in the 1950s petitioned the, the Louisiana Normal School, which is Northwestern State University, to integrate. And they reached out to uh, the future U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. And in 1965, the first uh, African-American students attended NSU. And wow. he was also a doctor in the uh, community and he provided medical care for African-Americans and, and for, uh, I think he worked for a few of the black schools as their medical consultant. Uh, so awesome. he and his wife were really big. And kind of more modern, we have Ben Johnson. We have, uh, mm -hmm. he was a, a, a business owner, a, a philanthropist here in the community. He had, he, um, you know, he used his philanthropy to help the African American community around him for mm -hmm. loans and scholarships, and uh, he received the NAACP Humanitarian Service Award and U.S. Bill Clinton um, and the African uh, President uh, Nelson Mandela all, you know, knew about him and praised him for what he did in the communities. And uh, you know, although he passed away. We have the Ben D. Johnson Educational Center. We have the Legacy Youth Workforce Development, and we have the Legacy Cafe, and that's all part of his uh, legacy. It's amazing. You know, Arlene, I keep wanting to talk about that. Uh, the Legacy Cafe. Yeah, we went there for there. lunch, and, and it's just it's good what they're doing. It, I mean, it's good what they're doing to help these uh, the youth, you know, and showing them jobs in the industry. But yeah, yeah. Um, Ben D. Johnson, he was, he was kind of a local hero and, and someone that uh, many, many people looked up to. And uh, I'm glad that she brought that up about the Ben D. Johnson uh, Center, because it's also now the home to the Boys and Girls Club, too. So it's. Oh, wow. It's, and they've got a statue out, out the front. I remember when it was just first opening, too, we, we went in there. That's right. And um, I had lunch and I, I got it all sucked into his story and what he did, because he, he was saying that it, in his side of town really there was almost a food desert for uh african americans to be able to get food and black you know black families and so he started the store he started a garden 
uh, there. So sometimes when you go have lunch there, you'll be getting lettuce from the garden. Um, but it's teaching kids how to grow their own food, eat healthy, and then also how to work. And I think that right. is so amazing that it's it's just this let's build up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that I thought that was he, he just seemed like someone who you could call when you needed help, you know, and that he would help you move forward, but also to learn a skill while you move forward, you know, mm -hmm. uh, very, very cool man. Um, so then when you think about, you know, Black History too, you go to Melrose Plantation, um, that's a that's a whole bunch of history in there, man. We, you know, I was just saying, you know, we still get comments from our videos that we did on Melrose Plantation and uh, the sharecropping video we did with Mr. Elvin Shields, you know, uh, over uh, from Oakland, Oakland Plantation. Plantation yeah. yeah, well, his cabin really, you know, that's in his yeah. family and uh, talks about what it was like to to live as a sharecropper family and yeah. um, just good good history to preserve so everyone understands. What, what it was like when you were talking about that, Janae, about going from slavery, it wasn't like, here, you're free, now, yippee yay yay It was so much work. There was, it was an hard. education. It was very hard. There, yeah, it was like, who's going to hire you? You know, it it just, um, it was really hard being a slave and then coming out of slavery. It was very difficult. Correct. And I mean, there was still so much oppression, even though say, okay, well, here, now you're Americans, but they really weren't treated like Americans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the plantation, that, that was their workforce. The planters didn't want them to leave. So they got the sharecropping system, which was, it just sort of was the cycle that, um, you know, there'd usually be a, a store. So you would get paid with tokens from the store. So you would work in the fields and you'd have to buy at the store and you'd wind up getting into debt and you just kind of, you have to stay there to pay off that debt. So it sort of kept it very insulated still. You weren't going off and working for something else. It kept yeah. people working those plantations and farms. It was almost a different form of slavery in some ways. And that, that also happened to white families in some parts of the country right. too. It really did. Um, you know, Arlene uh, going over to Melrose Plantation, Clementine Hunt, we've got to bring her up. Otherwise we're going to get calls. And, and Marie Coy Coy, <laughs> I know, uh, but Clementine Hunter, so she wasn't necessarily a slave or was she a slave first? She was not. She was born um, around 1880, so it would have been, slavery would have been abolished. Um, now her um, um, her parents would have been slaves and worked in the fields, you know, in Natchitoches Parish. But uh, Clementine grew up, she worked in the fields and she worked as a domestic, you know, helper around Melrose Plantation uh, for Miss Cammie Henry and her family, but she was not. She was not a slave. Mm. Yeah. And she comes became famous uh, painting because the, the plantation was really kind of like an artist. That's it was like, like one an of the artist first artist colony. That, that's a yeah. Little, yeah, little artist colony. Yeah. Right. Well, Miss Henry, Henry, when she took over Melrose Plantation, uh, her husband had passed away and she had seven children to raise and this big, you know, plantation. So she couldn't travel far. So she invited writers and artists to come stay at the plantation and uh so uh, clementine picked up some of the leftover paint and started marking her paintings as she called them she would mark her painting and uh yeah it, it just kind of took off from there and um when she died at the age of 101 it was said that she probably painted over 5,000 paintings and articles wow. you know, things that she painted on she painted on anything she could find really mm. pots snuff bottles roof shingles plywood uh window shades uh just a little bit of everything so wow wow but, uh, and then you've got marie coin coin so now marie coin coin that comes before that comes Mommy before Henry. that's actually how melrose plantation was established marie therese quan quan was born quan in the quan. i'll say it correctly quan yeah quan. <laughs> well quan quan is really just uh it's an african name that means second born daughter so she okay. was born in the household of St. Denis uh, at the fort, Fort St. John Baptiste. And um, I always did say that because she grew up watching him do trading with the Indians and the you know Spanish and all to the West, that she became a very smart businesswoman herself. And um, she had uh, five children with an Indian uh, slave. And then she had 10 children with a white Frenchman, Claude Thomas Pierre Matoir. 15 children? 
Yeah, she had 15 children in total. Yeah. So, uh, but the 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 Creoles, oh. the Mar <laughs> family from, from Melrose, that's where many of the descendants from the Creole community come from today here mm -hmm. in Natchitoches Parish. But yeah, so Marie Therese Quan Quan uh, grew up in the household of St. Denis, and then she fell in love with Marie, I mean, uh, with uh, Claude Thomas Bamford but they could never marry. They had all these children and they couldn't marry because French law, the code noir, he, you know, they couldn't have an interracial marriage. So he eventually married and had a family of his own, but he did give her a plot of land and a stipend. And she was able to acquire other land grants because she was a landowner, even, you know, later after the civil war and her children became landowners. They, they were all slaves and she were able, she was able to pretty much buy them all out of slavery and, um, you know, the rest wow. is history here in, in Melrose when it comes to Marie Therese Quan Quan and Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire. Um, they yeah. are, you know, she was certainly the matriarch of the Creole family here in Natchitoches. So. Wow. And so when you think about St. Augustine, um, the church, that that church that wasn't that one of the first black that was uh, her that was their dated. firstborn son that started mm -hmm. that church he built that church i want to say around 1803 i think this is the third church that's there now on the site this is the third church on the site but the first one would have been built around 1803 so claude thomas pierre matoire actually took his sons that he had with marie therese quan quan to france and it was there that um augustine the oldest son saw these French communities where the church was the heart and the center of the community. So when he came back to Melrose, he wanted to build a church. And mm -hmm. hence you have St. Augustine uh, Church down at Melrose. And uh, it's that's still where Clementine is laid to rest, too. Huh? That's where Clementine is laid to rest. That's where she is laid to rest. That is correct. Mm -hmm. And Augustine Matoire, um, uh, it, uh, that's where his tomb is, right directly mm -hmm. behind the church as well. Mm -hmm. So, oh, speaking of, um, you know, cemeteries, uh, you have a wonderful program over from the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, where Scotty takes people every Friday on a tour of the American Cemetery. That to me is a, a I'm dying to, uh, that was the wrong word. I really want to do that. <laughs> you're dying to go to the cemetery? <laughs> I am. You, you know, every time we come to town, I'm like, I got to go back to the cemetery. But I really want to do that tour. Is that still happening this year, every first Friday? Yeah, every first Friday of the month, uh, he's there, rain or shine, usually. Uh, I don't think we've ever had to cancel it. I filled in, I have filled in a couple of times, so I don't, we've never had to cancel it yet. Um, he loves giving it. Um, and, uh, you know, we do get a few people, which is good that the word's getting out, and it's a fun tour. You know, he doesn't do anything. It's very historical. He brings you to people who are, who have been, or, yeah, who were, uh, you know, uh, contributors to the community and, and pretty well known. Um, and the first, like the, he brings you to the first grave that they believe was ever um, put there. So he tells you a little bit the history of the cemetery too, which is great. Well, we, uh, he was on our show, I think it was September, October. And yeah. um, I mean, we got into the whole thing about how to protect the cemetery. I, I oh, he loves it. On. That's his thing. <laughs> He's got to come back on the show because we've got our friend over in England that wants to be on with him. And we're, we're going to have a, I don't know, a grave off. I don't. And then Asheville, <laughs> I, mean, I, I all these, I think we're just going to have to do a big map of all the cemeteries we've been to across the country. But these ancient ones are so important to protect and preserve. And I think when people go into the cemeteries, they get to understand this rich history i mean you're standing where people were you know you can't get closer than that um and and also they say saint denis was probably buried there oh we don't know for sure right that's the no we do not know for sure that's the gossip yes. <laughs> that's a mystery. Hey, hey i listen i i found out where the word gossip comes from so back in the day and i don't know what year it was i think it was the revolutionary war maybe i'm not sure but journalists being out there they wanted good news and, and to find out what's going on in the country and, and things. So the, one of the ways, other than church, they would send journalists to the bar, see, this is where I got <laughs> from, and tell them, the, the editors would tell the journalists, go sip. So you can hear all the scandal that's going on. And that's how <laughs> we found the word gossip. I have no, 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 no sip, I, no sip. See, and we've never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> we got the scandals. I wanted to go back a little bit because I'm looking at some stuff about Marie Therese Quan Quan. She was at Quan Quan. She was actually born in 1742. 
Wow. Um, at, at the fort, Fort St. John Baptiste. And she lived until the spring of 1816. Whoa. So if you think about it, that was a long time for people to live that long in those days with the harsh mm -hmm. conditions um, yeah. that they lived under. But uh, Marie, uh, Marie Therese Cronquoy's last days were spent at Melrose in the original family home, the Yucca House, because it was named Yucca oh. Plantation before Miss Cammie Henry renamed it Melrose Plantation. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, you know, like I mentioned, Marie Therese Cronquoy had the 10 children and... Uh, her third born son was the one that built the main house or what they call the big house at Melrose mm -hmm. Plantation. And, be, you know, her her children were so industrious and they were all free people of color. But when her daughter Suzanne died, and Suzanne and Augustine were twin brother and sister. But I have in here, and I, I wanted to read it to you all, that when she died, she was considered one of the that the whole family were, were very wealthy back in the day, if you can imagine. They were free people of color. Here it is before the Civil War in the 1830s. But when uh, Marie Suzanne Matoire died at her death in 1838, despite the worldwide financial crash that occurred the year before, the twin sister of Augustine Matoire left an, an estate valued at $61,000. <laughs> the equivalent of over 1.1 million in modern currency. And this is in the 1830s. And as a point of contemporary comparison, when the federal government in 1850 began to record property valuations on its censuses, the average farm in the parish of Natchitoches, one of the richest parishes in the state whose economy had already rebounded, was valued at $1,664. Suzanne's principal plantation, land alone, went for $20,000. And then her household inventory shows that she lived frugally. The only luxuries in which she indulged herself was a set of sterling silver flatware and a bicycle. Are you and that was in me? 1838 when she passed away. Wow, that's amazing. So what is real estate like now? <laughs> <laughs> but that just goes to show you they were free people of color. I mean, they were former right, that's slaves a big deal. given their freedom. And they were able, you know, to be very successful. Mm -hmm. Even Marie Therese Quan Quan, I mean, you know, she did um, um, herbs and, and medicinal herbs, and she also trapped bears and, you know, sold the oil and the the, the bear skins and everything and shipped it down Cane Don't River. Don't mess with Florida her. To Europe. She, that's what I'm telling you about. She grew up in the household of the commandant and she was pretty savvy business businesswoman. She saw how the trading was done and she got with it. They grew and, uh, indigo, um, you know. That's right, indigo tobacco, and tobacco. And, and then the African house there. I remember going to the, the African, African house, house and that's probably the that's unique structure. And that's mm -hmm. where Clementine Hunter back in 1955 she painted the murals, the African mm -hmm. House murals. And actually those murals at Melrose in the African House, the African House and those murals are named by the National Trust for Historic Preservation as a, a national treasure. It wow. was you know, when it was named a national treasure, it was the only national treasure listed in Louisiana. Even New Orleans did not have a national treasure. Uh, you go, girl. <laughs> you know, speaking of women, too, I got to bring up Carolyn Dorman. You know, mm -hmm. um, over at Briarwood, uh, you know, we have Kasachi National Forest, uh, the National Forest of Louisiana, uh, thanks to her and all yes. the botany and, you know, the, I just find it, you know, it, whenever you think of botanists and naturalists, it was mostly men back then. And here mm -hmm. she was, she was always, you know, she was a teacher and always, always being told what to do. And she said, no, I'm going to no. tell you. <laughs> So I think she's a she she's amazing, um, you know, and Cammie Henry, like you're saying. And so you start off, go go to the Louisiana Hall of Fame and the Louisiana State Museum. Go there. I'd also say uh, Grand Accord, but I also say take the walking tour, obviously the cemetery tour with Scotty, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, the Cane River National Heritage Area. They do those walking tours. Is that still happening? Yes, they meet here at our office, um, usually Wednesday through Saturday around 10 o'clock in the morning and people just kind of congregate and wait for the ranger to come here. 
and they take them on about a 45 minute, one hour walk through the historic district and give them a, a complimentary tour. Um, but I wanted to go back and say that Janae has some of those exhibits of Carolyn Dorman and Miss Cammie Henry yes. and Clementine Hunter, all those ladies. Uh, and and the her. farming, you have all this farming history yes. um, yeah. in there yeah. too. Yeah. 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 And you've got that cool car. Uh, we do have the cool car. You know, and people have said to us, they're glad that they came to us first because they get a great overview of Oakland, Magnolia, and even Melrose. And then they go to the sites and they already have a little bit of exactly. background. And I thought that's perfect. You're right. Because we really just do an overview because we're touching on 300 years of history in our section. And then you get to go to the places that are a little more focused on the families and the years that their areas were productive or, or, or inactive. So um, yeah, it works out great. <laughs> and I, I have photos of exhibits that uh, were the Caddo Indians. Um, yes. You had pottery. Is that something that's a, a, a permanent exhibit or is that something that was coming and going? Because I know you have rotating exhibits too. We do rotating that the upstairs exhibits are all permanent. So that's mm -hmm. like I said, when we have the Heisman Trophy, that was an addition to our permanent exhibits. Okay. And then we still have rotating exhibits in our changing gallery. Because the Native American history is really rich in your area too. Mm -hmm. um, especially you think about the El Camino de los Tejas. I mean, yeah, you, you guys are such a diverse uh, cultural community, which is so good, which no, then you know it's good food. You know, so that's a, I love going to Natchitoches because everyone gets along. It's just um, the history is incredible. Also, uh, you have the uh, genealogy libraries too. So if people researching family history, uh, Natchitoches, um, because of the, at the one time where the Red River was open, which is now Cane River Lake, and that's a whole other story of the Cane, of Red River um, changing up with all the logs and all of that. But didn't you get a lot of people coming through Natchitoches yeah. Um, so, so families could be tracing their history and because of that waterway. That that's true. And going back to the genealogy library, they have wonderful records dating back to the early 1700s. So oh. you've got church records, you know, baptism records, death certificates, marriage certificates from like the early 1700s that far back. Wow. Oh man. Okay. We're homesick now. <laughs> Just, sorry, we claim we claim Natchitoches as, as one of our homes. It definitely, uh, it's, you know, you've got special places when you travel full time. But everyone, again, LouisianaStateMuseum.org is a website for the Louisiana Hall of Fame and a uh, Sports Hall of Fame, excuse me, and Northwest Louisiana History Museum. And then also, of course, go to Natchitoches.com. And again, that is N-A-T-C-H-I-T-O-C-H-E-S.com. And keep up with us at BigBlendRadio.com. And of course, we also go to nationalparktraveling.com where we have a lot of our uh, stories uh, from our adventures in Natchitoches. So thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.